Let's do, let's do this for real this time. Oh, y'all, it's been a day. All right. We are going to talk about Mongoose referencing. And this is kind of the counter to what we did earlier with embedding. And um, just to kind of reference, again, well, reference, that's a bad word to use there, to recap um, what we were talking about earlier. There are two ways to model related data in MongoDB. Okay. Embedding, where parent documents hold subdata, and referencing, where a document contains just the related document's object ID. Okay. This can be a little confusing, and I want to try to get over the confusion by just kind of hammering home the differences between these two. And the biggest differences between these two are that embedding contains all of the subdocument in its entirety is contained within the parent. Okay, they're all they're all one. Whereas the referencing, we're keeping just the ID inside of a parent document, and that ID references a full document somewhere else. Okay, it's saying, hey, this is this. Think of it kind of like a pointer. It's like saying, yes, this represents this thing, but I'm keeping this thing over here. Okay, with with embedding, the thing is here. It's in the parent. With referencing, the thing is somewhere else in a different collection. We're just tracking its ID. And there's a magical method called populate that's going to let us turn just that ID into the full document that it represents. It essentially just like, think of it like a little seed that is sprouting into the full document whenever we put populate juice on it or, or something. I, I don't know. That kind of went off the rails. But you'll see this here in a second, okay? Referencing is the practice of establishing relationships between data entities by storing a reference in the form of an object ID to a related document within another document, rather embedding the related data. Okay, so I'm going to go and make this a little bit bigger for this example because I think it's important. And you'll see an example of what this might look like. Okay, assume a document from a people collection. Okay, Joe Smith is a person. Joe Smith has an object ID. Joe Smith also has a contacts array. And the way that this would be set up in the database is an array of object IDs. Okay, schema, mongoose.schema.types.objectid is the data type for that. What this says is contacts will be full of arrays, or contacts will be an array of just object IDs. And each of these object IDs represents a full other document, OK? There's a contacts collection. And each of the IDs in this represents a contact document. It is the contact documents object ID. So this first one that ends in 8391 represents this, type mobile contact 555555555. The bottom one ends in 7203, represents email joe at smith.com. <clears throat> okay. Again, difference between this and embedding is this. With embedding, the entire document is being held within the parent document. With referencing, just the object ID is held inside of the parent document, and it references something in another collection. Do we have questions on that? Because the, the, the big picture on this is going to help you understand how to make this all work. Aria. Um, you know how you wrote context? Where is that just something you assign, or is it referring to something? Where? Because it's written like three different places oh, on two different um, pages. Circle uh, what you're talking about. Sure. Okay. Contacts, this would be built in the um, schema. So just like we built reviews inside of our schema, there would be a contacts array that we built inside of the schema. And it would okay. represent a, there would be a contact collection. Like we'd have a collection of contacts. So we can still use that same word. Like we're going to have, <clears throat> for example, we're going to build a performer model. And that performer model will have performer documents within it. And
And we're going to embed the IDs of the performers into a cast array inside of our movie. That's how that's going to work. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Well, if you have questions as I go through this, please ask them. Because the, the thing that trips people up with all of this is that it, it's confusing. I get it. But the only way that you're going to get past that is by asking questions. So if you're not doing that, do it. Okay. Asa. I'm sorry, but can you go through the, can you just walk through the dis, uh, the difference between them one more time? Sure. The difference between referencing and embedding is that in embedding, we store the entire sub document within the parent document. And referencing, we store just the object ID of a document that references another document inside of the parent document. So which document, if we have to put the reference in one of the things, which object, which document should hold that object ID? Should I put the contact ID, the ID for the contact inside of the person, or should I put the ID of the person inside of the contact? Does it matter? Here's a question first. Does it matter? Can I achieve the same thing either way? It probably matters sometimes depending on what you're building, right? Would that yes. be the difference between one to many or many to many? It would not. Oh, okay. Um, because it's still technically going to be it, where you put that object ID doesn't really, it still makes a connection. The difference is how you're querying for data, okay? Technically, you can do both. You could put in both places if you wanted to. If you wanted to say that your object or your person object has, again, a list of contacts and each contact has a person where you're referencing the person, you could do it one, the other, or both. Okay. You could store that data however you want. Okay. I can reference the person inside of the contact. I can reference the contact inside of the person, or I could do both. Doesn't matter. The place that it becomes important is when you're querying for data, okay? And when you're when you're building things out. If, for example, I am looking up a person's contacts, okay? I'm looking up a person and then I want to find all of their contact info. If I, my data is set up like this, it would be far easier to have it set up like this because when I'm uh, querying for the person, I can populate contacts and instantly turn these two documents into full object or full documents, right? I can I can use the populate command to turns this into all of this, just like that. Okay, and the populate command turns this into all of this. If I had set it up the other way around, I want to find a person and all of their related contact information. I would need to query for this. And then I would need to do another query for my contacts and find every single contact where the uh, name that is referenced also equals the name of the contact that I just found. Okay, that would be, I could do the same thing, but querying for that is going to be much more difficult. <coughs> it's going to be a pain in the ass. Okay, one of the things that we're going to ask you when you turn your uh, ERDs in is why have you decided to structure your your data this way? Why are you storing your reference here instead of there if we think it's weird? Because while you could technically get away with it and it would technically work, we're trying to build these in such a way that your queries are as simple as possible and that you're not having to do ridiculous queries. The other thing that you have to think about is, you know, it, a lot of students will ask, well, if we can do it both ways, why don't we just do it both ways all the time? That way we never have to worry about how we query things. We just either use one query or use the other. And that's a great thought until you come across deleting. Because when you start deleting, then you have to delete. So let's say I delete this contact, right? If I delete this contact, the way things are written right now, I have to delete it here. And I have to delete it inside of here. That's an extra step. Okay. If I had done it the other way, I guess the other way doesn't really hurt us any, but 
when you, when you have things that are referenced in 17 different places and you start getting going wild with referencing, you have to remember where you're referencing things. Because if you're referencing one value in seven different places and you go and delete that one value, now you have to go delete it from those seven places to remove the references. So you got to be careful with that. Okay. Those are called orphaned records. And we want to make sure that we stay away from those at all costs. Okay. You do not want orphaned records. Those are bad news. So you have to keep track of where you're referencing things so that if for some odd reason you end up deleting something that has that's being referenced somewhere, you delete it from the place that it's being referenced as well. That doesn't automatically happen. Um, doing that, uh, as a fun side note and tidbit of information, uh, is a lot easier in a SQL database with something called cascade deletions. Um, you can actually set your models up in a SQL database to say, hey, when I delete this, make sure you go and delete it from all the places that it's currently referenced. That is actually a feature of SQL. Uh, it's a lot harder to do that with MongoDB. You can set things up using some of those custom Mongoose middleware methods um, that happen kind of during the model's life cycle, but we don't really talk about that as much because it's a lot more advanced than we need to be doing in this class but you can technically do it. It's just a lot of work, okay? So it doesn't matter which one holds the document or holds the reference, you just need it to make sense for querying. Make your queries as easy as possible. Okay. So the other thing is the why, okay? If, if we can hold, if, if embedding is more efficient, why do we need to reference things at all, okay? And then the first is data. Okay. If the amount of data is over the 16 megabyte size limit for a document, okay, that's not going to happen. That will absolutely not happen. Exceeding that size is very, very, very uncommon. Okay, All of Shakespeare's works together are fewer than five megabytes. So the likelihood of this happening is not the case. And this is 16 megabyte limit for one document. Um, as an example... Uh, let's look at say what? Okay, well, I need to look into that. That's unfortunate because that's where Clippy is. And if I can't access that, that's a problem. What's something that has a lot of data in it? Um, where's my weather data? Oh, I think I had that in a separate. I was looking for something that has a ton of data in it, just so I could show you that how small these documents actually are. But I don't think I have a good example of it here. Oh, well. The college basketball one? With there's like, there's nothing in there. Um, has anybody else used my high score API? No. That'd be pretty cool. I can see who plays my game. Um, Here's a thousand Pokemon. Okay. And it takes up 315K. Okay. There are 1,000. This is all the Pokemon. Okay. Each one of them has its own document. And there are 1,008 of them. Okay. And that takes up 
three 115 kilobytes. Okay, that's nothing. So if we were for some reason to go over the 16 megabyte size limit for a single document, then referencing might be useful. Okay. Also, let's think up another example. When multiple parent documents need access to the same child document and that child's data changes frequently. Okay. Think about a bank account. A bank account can be owned by more than one individual. Okay. Imagine the account data were embedded in two or more parent documents. Okay. We have account data that lives in both places. So every time that we need to make an adjustment to the account, we now need to go to two different places to do that. That would be terrible, right? Let's say that we've got some family banking account for the family checking account. I guess it's still usually only two people that have access to that. But what I'm saying is it, it should point to one thing, and then those other two things should reference that one thing so that when changes need to be made, they get made to the one thing that then are reflected in the other two things. Okay, that is why referencing is important. The third is probably the most exam uh, most important example, and that's if it makes sense for your application. Okay, for example, if you wanted to view all posts on your landing page, regardless of the user that posted them, it would take more effort to extract the posts from each user if they were embedded. So, for example, if I have a user model that has a set of posts for every user and I want to put all of the posts on a landing page. It's a lot more efficient for me to have the post as its own separate model and just say post.find to get all the posts than it is to say, okay, I have to loop through all of my users. So now I have to write an asynchronous loop to go through all of my users in the database and find all of the posts for all of the users. That code is a nightmare to write. Whereas if I had organized my data differently, I could just say, yeah, go find me all the posts, post.find, curly brackets. That's it, okay? So you have to think about how you're setting things up, when you're setting things up to get the best bang for your buck. When you're setting those up, just think about the queries. Your wireframes will help you with this. It's why we require you to do wireframes. We can look at your wireframes. We can look at your ERD and say, this is what you have on this view. Why are you querying for it? Like you're going to have a, a bitch of a time querying for it like this. You should probably set this up instead of embedding as referenced or instead of referencing as embedding because it'll be easier for you to write that code. Capiche? Rich. Just a question about your language usage. <clears throat> when you say querying for data, do you mean literally anything that draws upon the data, like any of the RESTful methods and anything? Or do you mean the, the document? Oh, okay. Okay, I see. Specifically This is that. querying. Yeah. Querying okay. is using the model to search for data with one of these methods. Find, find by ID, whatever. Yeah. Because that's how we use the model to search for data in the database. Great question. All right, we're gonna do a little refactor here, okay? We're going to get rid of cast in our movies because cast is no longer going to be a string. We're going to make cast an array of object IDs. So let's go into our movie model and delete that. What problem are we going to have now with new entries? And with old entries. It'll Does break that... if you have pass attached to it? Yeah. Our old data, this doesn't delete that data from the database. All of our data that's stored inside of our database These movies still have cast as strings. So that's a problem. So I'm going to delete them. No more movies. All of our movies are gone. I just deleted them. Neener, neener. 
Okay. Also, please don't create more movies now until we've done this next part because it's going to break every, everybody's app. I mean, that's not fun. Okay. Aria. So when we're building our apps, we want to make sure that we have all the parts to the movie scheme or like whichever, whatever we're building. Um, because if we don't, then it's going to break. Because if you keep adding or changing things, right? Adding things is not a problem. Changing things is where you run into problems. So I can I can build something out and then add a property to a model and then have no problems. With that. Well, minimal problems with that. If I go and change something, like for example, movies, and with cast, I make it so that instead of cast, instead of having a strings, it's an object ID instead of mm -hmm. a string. Okay, that presents a massive problem and will break most of our application because of the way that data is being stored. And with the way that you do this in your database, you're going to come across times like this while you're building that you're like, oh, shit, I probably should have done it that way. And you just need to wipe the data in your database. You can't be afraid to do that. You're going to have to wipe the data in your data. It's called dropping a database. Um, you're going to have to do that sometimes. It's just the nature of what you're doing. Um, you'll have to do it a lot more in SQL databases because of the way that relationships are created there. Um, but yeah, if we change something that will break down the road, when again, how it's going to break down the road is not something you have seen yet because I haven't shown you how populate works. But if we had a cast in here that was just strings and we tried to populate that, it's going to break our app. It's going to be like, you're trying to populate something that's not an object ID. What are you doing, you crazy person? And it just, it won't even render the page. It'll just, it'll just error out and say no. Got so, it. thank you. Yeah. You will have to refactor these things as you build them all out, y'all. It's just how it works. That's part of building an app is thinking, oh, crap. Now I just changed that. So I got to go wipe my data again. It happens. <sighs> all right. Next thing we're going to do. Um, the next things that we're copying and pasting, I want you to just copy and paste with me and not worry about the specifics. All we are doing in these next steps where we're copying and pasting is we're adjusting things that have to do with cast. So with new, we're taking out the form that we use to enter cast members. Okay, That's all the, the change that we're doing here. Okay, So we're going to go into our new EJS. We're going to copy this. We're going to go back over here and we're going to paste right over on top of it. Okay. The, the, again, the only thing that we're removing is the form for entering cast. Everything else is the same. So don't worry about, oh my God, I don't understand. What we're, it's, we're just removing a couple lines, but in order to stay consistent across all of our apps, we're just going to copy paste. Okay. Same thing with show. There's another cool thing here that I'm going to show you in a minute that we're doing with that. I'll show you when we get done with the copy paste fest. Okay. Edit EJS. And we need to update our create and update controllers. Okay. Our create controller. We need to get rid of the um, cast thing because we're not doing this anymore. So if rec.body.cast goes away because we're not doing that anymore. We're not checking to see if that's a string. So we need to delete that there. Delete it in the comment and delete it in our update function. Okay, I'm going to push my code. Cool. The other thing that we added that was kind of, we just threw this in there without really doing anything. Let me make a new movie and I'll show you. 
beef and what's for dinner. That's definitely rated R. Um, if I put a review in now, uh, needs gravy. It shows me the average review rating. Okay. And I could say delicious as a five. Okay. Now it shows three because the average rating for those is three. This was something we just kind of pasted in there. Um, we also have a delete button, but no delete functionality. Okay. So if we push delete, technically there's a delete controller there or delete code there, but it's not. The functionality isn't there. If you want to build that in later, you're more than welcome to. Okay. The button's there for you to add that functionality in. But the way that this works is on our show view, we're actually running JavaScript. Okay. So what we do is we declare a variable inside of our EJS file like this and say let total equals zero. We can do that. It's just JavaScript. Okay. We're saying let total equal zero. And then when we do our reviews dot for each, every total or every review we have, we bump total up by that, whatever that rating is. And then we take the total, divide it by the movie reviews dot length and fix it at one character. And we'll see how, what the average rating is, or we'll fix it at one decimal. We get to see what the average rating for a movie is pretty cool. Okay, this is again not a super big part of the lesson. It's just showing you you can execute JavaScript inside of these EJS statements. It's pretty cool. Okay. Delete that. We need to remove all the existing cast values. So we go to drop collection. We did that. So I'm not worried about it anymore. Unless any of you have added movies, which I don't think you have, we're good. Okay. Let's add performers. This is where the, we have to start thinking. Okay. As a user, I should see a form to add a performer on the add performers page. I should be able to add the name of a performer, a new performer, if the performer is not already in a dropdown of added performers. Okay. Just think with me for a second here. As a user, I should see a form to add a performer on an add performer page. What is it, what do you think that means? What do you think we're going to need to do to, to make that happen and to add a performer? How many times are we going to need to go through the five step cycle to do that? Twice. Right. Once we have to for show the the form, and then okay. we have what, to. What controller is that? What would the controller name be called? for that yeah. function the controller name oh you yeah, it, it would be a get method you got seven to pick from edit update create delete uh oh. new and uh edit and show oh no go would it be new? It'd be new. Why is it new? Because we're adding and creating new uh, new documents. No. With performers. What are we, what is the job of a new controller? To return view to add a new performer. To render a form. To gen return a view with a form in it. That's the new controller's job. I can tell y'all are shaky on this after y'all tanked the quiz earlier. Yeah. The new controller's job is to display a view to render a form, to add a new resource, okay? 
There's no data creation going on there. It's just show me a form so that I can add a new resource. By the way, if you feel bad about doing bad on that quiz, don't, most of you did. So everybody's, you did about how I thought you'd do. So don't freak out about tanking that quiz. A lot of people tank that quiz, which is fine. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm just trying to re remind all of you that a lot of you are on the same page. We're, you're getting there though. Okay. We need to go through the process for new. And once we've gone through the process for new for the performer resource, what do we go through after that to actually create a new, I just said it. We, we, it's gonna be the create controller, right? New controller first to render a form on a new view, then the create controller to actually create the performer. Okay. We do that with every resource. Every resource is going to be set up the same way. So do we have a performer resource? No. So we're going to need one. We're going to need a performer's router. We're going to need a performer's model. We're going to need a performer's controller. We're going to need a performer's directory for views. All of those things. It's a new resource. So let's start with the model. Okay. New file. Performer.js. Okay. Do I have to remember all this? I'm not even going to copy and paste it from oops, from here. Where where should I copy and paste it from? Movie model. Yeah, just take the movie model. Okay, it's already written out. We'll just change some stuff. Okay, everything in it is we're, we're we don't need anything in it yet. We're going to add our fields in a second. Okay, we don't have the embedded model, so that can go. This is going to be a performer schema. Performer. 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 Well, that was easy. Why we give you templates, okay? Your auth template will have two models built into it. If you want to use one of them as a template for other models, go for it. Super handy. Okay, then we just add our field in. I want a name property on the performer that is a type string required true, okay? As some of you look up some of these data validation properties, data validation properties, um, you'll see that there is a unique option. Don't use that. Please don't use unique true in any of these things. I know it sounds cool and fancy and you want to be awesome, but don't use that because there are things that happen behind the scenes when you use that that make it changing it a nightmare. Okay. You'll actually, in order to change it, we'll have to wipe your ent entire database to make it work. And you're not going to want to do that. Like you'll have to go to Atlas and delete it. And it's just a pain, a super big pain to do that. So try not to use the unique true um, identifier. There are times when you would want to use that. This is not one of them. Cool. So that's done. Our five-step cycle using the chart tells us that we need what? Which one of these do we want to follow first for performers? One through seven. Six. Mm -hmm. Just like we said, new controller, right? So we need a get request to slash blogs slash new. 
performers slash performers slash new. Okay. Where are we going to do that? We already have all of our shit like that up here in our nav bar. Let's throw it there. So let's go to nav EJS. Well, let's just take one of these and copy it down. And this will be slash performers slash new. And this will be add performer. Quick refresh, she'll show us that that shows up, which it does. Hooray. And if I click it, I should get a 404. Boom. Okay. Down here. If you have a 404, this is the first place you look. If you have a 404, this is the first place you should look. If you have a 404, this is the first place you should look. Okay. If you post in engineering that you have a 404, I'm going to ask for a screenshot of this because this is the first place that you should be looking. And the reason is this tells you exactly what route you are hitting. Okay. This says I'm making a get request to slash performers slash new. If I were debugging this to say, why, do, why am I getting a 404? The first thing that I would do is look at this and then say, do I have a route that matches that request? Okay. That's how you fix every 404 or start to fix every 404 ever, ever. Okay. So where do we go from here? We need a route, right? Do we have a router? No. Do we have a controller? No. We need to go stub all that shit up. Okay. We do we just did that. Cool. So let's touch a router and a controller. Okay. Inside of our routers directory or routes directory, we're going to add a file called what? Performers.js. Inside of our controllers, we're going to create a file called what? Same thing. Cool. I'm going to stub up my controller first. I guess that technically there's not really anything to put in the controller yet. So we can stub up our router first. Okay. Should I write this from scratch? No. This has everything we need. Copy. Paste. Get rid of the routes. And change this from movies control to performers control. Okay. There's your router. See how easy that was? We've done so much of this work already. We just need to tweak things. Okay. Don't write all this code again. There's no reason to do that. It doesn't make you smarter. I promise. Don't sink your brain energy into that. Okay. Now that we have a router, let's go to server and mount it. Lucky for us, we can just copy these down and say performers router. And performers.js. And then down below where we have them mounted, we do the same thing. I'm going to add commit and push there because I've stubbed up and configured a new resource. That's a good place to add commit and push. Good. 
Next, we can proceed on our little five-step journey. We kind of get caught there having to go create some resources, but now we're Gucci. So let's go and create that slash performer slash new route. Okay. And our routes, performers, we'll come up with one, router.get, we, because we want a get to localhost 3000 slash performers slash new, which is going to be router.get new. We want performers controller dot new. Then let's stub up the function. Doink. What am I going to import at the top of this file? What's imported at the top of every controller file? The movie. I heard movie and I, what was the other one? That was that you? I was wrong. Tommy, what do you got? The model. The model. Yeah. You, Rich, you were right, but kind of. It's the model. Okay. So we're going to import performer from model slash performer.js. Then technically we don't need that for, well, we do need that for this, but Sometimes you don't on the first one, okay? On the new controller, sometimes you don't need the model. But technically, we will here. And we, why, why we need it will be something I explained momentito. But let's take the next step of this. We write function, new performer, rec res, and we'll export it. As new. Then our server is happy again. Can I test it? Yes, we can. Let's just write something in here. Res.send fart noise. And if I hit refresh, I should see. Oh, I got to refresh the page. Oh, no, we saw it. Fart noise. We're good. We're going to take a break before we come back and finish writing this controller because it's going to be a bit and there's a lot that's going to happen in it. So take 13 whole minutes and come back at five after. So we're at a point now where we need to write this new controller. And I want to remember, but I'm going to back up for a second in the long, long ago, like, you know, 15 minutes where we talked about this. And let's think about the function, uh, function, <laughs> fart noise. Uh, let's think about the functionality we actually need here. Okay. When I click on add performer, I want to be shown a drop down of all of the performers that have currently been added so that a user is able to add a new performer if the performer is not already on that drop down list. What do you think that means I need inside of this controller function? If I want to render a view that has a list of performers not currently associated with this movie. You need to reference the initial movie model or a database rather. We'll get to that part in a minute. Let's just think first about what specifically I need. I need all the performers, right? You're, you're thinking about the part where we have the movie. And when we eventually have the movie, I'm going to be able to add a performer if they're not associated with the movie. I just want a list of all the performers right now so that I can say, is the performer on my list of performers? Like to the overall list. Not We're not thinking about movie stuff yet. I still, I forgot we actually erased those from the movies already. Yeah. I was... So I, I'm going to add Carrie Fisher to my list of performers, okay? 
I need to check a drop down list to make sure that Carrie Fisher is not already on that list of, of performers. Okay. I'm adding a performer to the database, but I don't want to add a performer that already exists. Movies right now, completely off to the side. Forget about movies. We're not talking about movies. We're just talking about performers. So if I want a list of all of the performers that currently exist in the database, what do I need to do? Begins with a Q. Query. Query. I need to query for them. I need to search for all of the performers. So let's do that. Let's do performer.find. And we're going to find all of the performers. Sorry, David's reaching out to me about teaching some, making some video. You know how y'all did the async videos at the beginning that were absolute trash? He wants me to build a couple of them for unit two. So, um, yeah, good stuff. Okay, performer.find. Then what's the result of performer.find? What does that return? Performer.find sends back performers. Performers. Y'all just have like a bunch of cheeseburgers for lunch or something? Like, what's up? Why are we all sleepy? Performers. Okay. Then let's render our new view. Performers slash new sending our performers. Probably need to send a title to that too. Yeah. Let's add some error handling in. I can rewrite this one real quick. Um, what does this mean? Render the performer's form. Right. Specifically, what is that form called and where is it located? We haven't made it yet. Right. Where is it going to be located? What is it going to be called? In the views. Okay. Inside of the views, we have a... We have to create a performer folder. Okay. And inside of that, we have new.ejs file. Correct. Excellent. Let's test it. Bang. We're just, 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 just testing. We're going to use partials here in a second. Okay. Um, let's do another part noise. 
And if I hit add performer, I now see fart noise with some fart emojis. Okay. I feel like we need fart humor to wake half of you up. So that worked. Cool. That works. Delete it. We need partials. Okay. Should I go and type this out by hand with my partials? No. No. What should I do? Copy what you found in movies. Yeah. Just pick any of these. And then wipe all of the stuff inside of them to get the partials. Change this to performers and then new.css because we already have a style sheet, right? Yeah, it already exists. Okay, this brings up a good point. This app already has styling in it, right? That's kind of cheating. How do we, how do you do this on apps that you build for yourselves? What do you do? When do you add styling? At the end? Yeah. You can add some basic styling if you want as you go to like make things centered, right? Centering things is not hard, especially with Flexbox. You just make it a flex container, justify content, center, align items, center, and you're good. It's everything centered. Okay, three lines of code, you can center anything. So you can use that to kind of get things in line and then adjust it at the end, okay? Don't spend six months writing CSS out while you're doing this because it's gonna change. You're gonna change it, okay? The other thing I would suggest, some of you did this in your unit one projects, maybe some of you a little bit more than you should have, use CSS as a way to reward yourself if you like CSS. Okay. If you're one of those people that's just like, ah, oh, CSS is awesome, then use it as a, oh, I need to get through this controller function. And once I get through this and have this resource working, I can go give myself some joy by writing CSS. Okay. Use it as a, a tool to move you forward. Very good tip if you're into styling. If you're not into styling, talk to somebody else, okay? One of the things that I wish more of you had done last unit was before your project was due, say, hey, can you look over the, just look over my project and give me some feedback on like page layout and stuff like that? It's because a lot of you were kind of scrambling at the last minute, okay? If you get, you're going to have a little bit more time to work on this project because A, we're not going to have a crazy long break in the middle of it. And B, you're not going to have a holiday interrupt your week. So you're going to have more time to work on this. Does that mean you should wait again to start on it? No. Get going on it as soon as possible. Once we learn auth, you're good to start on this stuff. Okay? Get your planning materials in early. They're due Friday. Get them in Wednesday. Thursday, probably. Okay? If you get those in early, I'll review them early. You can start on your project early. You can finish early. Get styling done. In a, you'll have tons of time for styling. Don't drag your feet on this. If you don't want to be stressed the fuck out during project week, get a start on this now, okay? If you haven't already come up with what you think you're going to do for your project idea, you're behind. I gave you a little preview as to what the requirements were last week. I'm going to go over them specifically when we get done with this lecture. But you should have some idea of what you want to do. Okay. If you wait until Thursday to come up with a project idea, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're going to have to have an ERD, wireframes. You're going to have to have so much planning done, and you're not going to be able to do that in a day. You could do it in a day, but you shouldn't. Give yourself time. That way, when I give you feedback back, you're able to adjust that and pivot and make it work. Moving on. We have our partials set up. Let's go ahead and add this main tag. And what you will see is this. Okay, All we're doing, again, there's nothing wonky or crazy here. 
all we're doing is we've got an H1 that shit says as add performer. We have a P tag that says, please make sure the performer's not in the dropdown. We have a dropdown with nothing in it. We have a select tag inside of which is an option for every performer. So every performer that we have in the database is going to be in a dropdown. We don't have any yet, so we don't have any. But you're going to see if when we start adding them, they're all going to start showing up. Beneath that, we have a form. Okay. Important things about our form. This is just for styling. This is an action and a method. What does this mean? What's going to happen when I submit this form? My server is going to make a blank request to blank. Okay. Post request to... Um, sorry. You're right. Uh, Perform. slash performers. Sorry, there's a honking yeah. truck outside. Yeah. When we submit this form, it's going to make a post request to slash performers. Okay. Other important part, name, name. Why is this name? Because that's the name of, wow, that's not confusing. Because that's what we call our data for the performers um, model. In the model, yes. In the model, name is the field that we're using. Okay. If you wanted to prevent you, the confusion here on this, when you're building stuff out and do like performer name, I would be okay with this just because in your view, doing that would allow you to write something like this. Right? I'm okay with that. If that helps you, then do it. Because name, name can be confusing. I'm not going to do that here because it's going to mess with the lesson, but I would be okay with that. Cool. So we're done with the first five steps. We have our new view. Shows our shit. So what do we do next? Start with the five steps again. Which one of these are we going to use? One through seven. Three. Three. We're going to make a post request to slash performers to create a new performer with a create function. Then redirect. Where are we going to redirect? Doesn't really matter. What's the best UI what, or UX? I think after we add a performer to the list, we should go back to the list of performers to see the performer we just added. Okay. So it'll take us back to our performer new page. Do we have a performers index page? No. No. Our new page indexes the performers, kind of, okay? And this is, again, one of those things that I want to talk about. You're not always going to have all of the views for every resource, okay? Some apps, it's not feasible to do that. It's, it makes no sense to do that. Here, for example, if I have all of the performers listed in this dropdown, it would be silly to add multiple or to have another view where I list all the performers, right? A new performer view already has all of that information here. So we don't do that. So let's go right our route. We need a post request to slash performers. Which is going to be our create method. Let's go add our create method. Okay. 
This one's going to be pretty easy. We just have one field inside of performer. We don't have to do any data massaging. Rich? Sorry, could you go back one step up? Uh, remind me why we don't need slash new for the host router? The chart. Oh, just, oh okay. Just because it says it there. No chart. Or no new. You never do a post request to slash new. The only time new is going to be in your route is for the new router or for the new route. Are you able to verbalize the logic behind that or does that not matter? Should I just trust the chart for now? It's RESTful routing. That's the technical answer to that. The, the convention states that if you want a new resource, you put the word new in your route. And to create a new resource, you do a post request to the pluralized version of said resource. It's literally convention. I think I'm still getting a little caught up on how, I'm sorry, whoever I just interrupted. I think I'm, I, I'm still sometimes getting caught up between that column that your mouse is on right now. Uh, yep. And the, the paths and the routes and stuff, sometimes they still get a little uh, commingled in my head. Check out the purpose. Uh, so the slash new is to return the view, the form, in order to hit the post to actually create the block. The slash new has nothing to do with that. No, I know. They're totally different. Oh, I thought you said the slash new is to do that. Sorry. No, no. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. You're going to just know that this is a convention. And it's one of those things that wraps will get you where you need to go. So it, I, it, honestly, like the reason that you should, I told you all to print this out is so you can use this every single time. Okay. Don't try to write routes, routes and controllers without this yet. Just use it every single time. You can't go wrong. If you're following this chart, like when y'all did the little index exercise the other day with movies and your groups, when we had like half the groups write index inside of their endpoints, like I, it's still all the groups do it every single time we do this exercise. And I don't understand why, because it's not written anywhere here, right? Index is not written in any of these endpoints. So the word index should never appear in any of your routes. It's just because it's never here. It's just, you gotta use the chart. Gotta always, always, always use the chart, okay? That's, you'll, your project will get returned to you if you have one route that doesn't use the chart that you should be using the chart for. Some of the routes you're gonna see in a while, you actually can get by without having to use the chart, but those are complicated ones. If you have a simple RESTful route and it doesn't follow these conventions, your project's gonna get kicked back. And I'm gonna tell you in big bold letters on your code review, this route doesn't match convention, use the chart. Okay, you gotta use the chart. This is unit two, unit three, and the rest of your life stuff. Christina. I think I got lost trying to follow along, but like my performers form for my new EG, EJS file is not loading. And from my end, I see I connected everything correctly, but apparently. Let's check it out. Okay, my code. Okay, so I perform so I imported my performance controller in my route and I made sure to add the route in my server. Yes, yeah, so I created a performance. Oh ah. Cool. Never mind. Cool. Looks like some people have already gotten to the next step. I love it. Okay. So let's write it out. Let's go to our create controller and performer.create using rec.body. Rec.body is what again? What you enter to the input? 
the form. Yeah, form data. The results. Yeah. You're both right. Yeah, you're both you're both right. Form data is what I'm looking for. Okay. Rectop body is going to be form data. How do I access the route parameters? Rec.body.params. 66% of that's correct. Rec.params. Just rec.params, yeah. Cool. Rec.body, form data. Rec.params, URL parameters. Rec.body, form data. Rec.params, URL parameters. Okay. Then, performer. Okay. Performer isn't needed here. We don't actually use this performer to do anything, but get in the habit of doing this for React because you're going to need it in React. Then let's redirect to slash performers slash new. Okay. Error handling. I'm going to make the error handling here back to slash performers slash new. Let's try it out. Harrison Ford. Oh, somebody put something big in here. Oh, no. See, that's no good. So this is an instance where this is not what we want. So how do we fix this? Wipe the data? Yeah. Do we need to wipe all of the data? No. What we can do is we can go in here, go to our movies database, go to performers and find the offending one and just click delete. And now we have normal data again. Okay. You can selectively delete data like that in Atlas or in Compass. It's pretty awesome. Okay. So we have Harrison Ford. Let me add all my Star Wars peeps. Okay. Got a nice little list of people here. Okay. This works. Let's add a funny one. Uh, Flurp Derpson. Derperson. Are these, how are these organized? It looks like by order of input. Yes. Creation date or yeah. create that. Yeah. How do I sort them alphabetically? Uh, when they're in the array, you can sort them there and then print them out in alphabetical order. That's too hard. Too hard. In the database, maybe? Negative name. Name. Why is that? Looks like we're closer. There are two of them that are showing up. Space in front of them. Space is in front of them. Ew. Yeah. My point, though, look how easy it is to sort shit using Mongoose. Instead of making a new array and then sorting the array and then returning the array and then look, dot sort. Very, very easy. Okay. I kind of like that. I'm going to leave it. So we've created a few 
performers. We're good. Okay. I'm going to add commit and push. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, now let's talk about the important thing, how to relate them, okay? Here's an example, a very simplified example of how we are going to set this up. A movie has many performers, a performer has many movies. This is a many-to-many -many relationship, okay? Multiple movies can reference the same performer creating a many-to-many -many relationship. Here is a simplified example, okay? The thing that is simplified here is the object IDs. We've used shortened object IDs to make this easily readable, okay? This is not what object IDs look like. I repeat, this is not what object IDs look like. This is simplified so that we don't have crazy long things here in this example, okay? Star Wars. The old cast would look like this, okay? We kept strings in here. What we're going to do here is we're going to reference using the object IDs from another collection. These are our performers. So Star Wars has Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford. Okay, we are referencing their object IDs inside of this array. Okay, without doing anything to it, is there any way I know what this means? No. This just looks like an object ID in the database. Okay, I'll prove it. Let me go to something that has auth related um, users. Okay, here's David's user. Profile. There's a related profile. Do I have any idea what this related profile is? No. It's just an object ID. Okay. If I look at profiles, I can see that. I can see what his actual info is. Okay. This profile is what is being referenced here. But without a, a way to turn this ID into the document that it represents, it's just an ID. You're going to see that here in a second when we get to this. This is that's the confusing part about this is how populate works. And again, if you'll remember me talking about this, populate's one of those things that I wish I had paid more attention to. So pay attention. Okay. Air Force One, Harrison Ford and Glenn Close. Hook, Harry Fisher, Glenn Close, Robin Williams. Yes, they were all three in that movie. I always think they're not, but they are. And Mrs. Doubtfire, Robin Williams, okay? We're gonna reference the performers with their object IDs inside of the cast property of the movies. Does that make sense? If that doesn't make sense, please, for the love of God, say something, because this is a really important concept and I wanna make sure y'all get it. You're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to build your ERDs if you don't understand this. Aria. Um, I'm just, I, I get the part that you discussed, but I, I, is there something to do with the old cast? That's just showing you what it looked like. We're going to get rid of that. That's just okay. there for demonstration purposes. This is saying this is how we used to be storing it. Oh, okay, okay. And technically, this should say... It should look like this. I think the reason we... Let's do this. I like that. I'm just going to delete it from this line. Now let's say 
technically I can't because it's a JSON object. It's not going to let me format that the way I want it to. But you see what I'm saying. This is what the old cast would have looked like. It would have been an array of strings, but now it's an array of object IDs. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, here's our ERD. Oh, God. That's not what you want. Is that a little better? Man, why does that look so shit? <sighs> All right. Well... <laughs> Um, we'll just kind of roll with it. Our movie and our performer are both models. I'm sorry for the quality of this. I'll go yell at David afterwards. This is most likely his doing. Um, the, I actually have a, his, his whimsical login information, so I can go and fix this later. All of the information that we have here is in our two models, Right. Our movie model and our performer model are both main models. They are their own collections. Okay. Our cast is going to be an array of object IDs that reference a performer. Okay. An array of object IDs that reference a performer. Our reviews are an array of review schema subdocuments. One to many, many to many. I can put any performer in any movie as many times as I want. Okay. Notice the little, uh, you can't see these because it's this terribly pixelated image, but see how this has the little many funnels on each side and it only has the one to many and a many to many. That's how you, it's called the little cardinality arrows. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, Christina. Sorry, just trying to repeat the logic. So looking at that diagram, the cardinality. So performer and movie has that many to many because a performer if you're looking within the performer data, you could see what movie no. they were in? Okay. Absolutely not. You cannot. A performer data is only going to show you the name of the performer, the way we're setting this up. If you look at the movie data, you'll be able to see a list of object IDs that reference performers. Right. So a performer, again, Mark Hamill, can be in any movie. He can be in multiple movies. Carrie Fisher can be in multiple movies. That movie, the movie that they are in is not stored on the performer document. The performer is stored on the movie document, but only its object ID is stored here. So, so that's why it's many to many. It's many to many because there are many movies can have many performers and many performers can belong to many movies. So don't think about it like it has to be many to many because we are referencing something. You don't have to have... That's usually a good rule of thumb, but it's not an always or never type situation. Think about the the better way to think about it is what like think about the real world entity, right? Mm -hmm. Ariana Grande has multiple albums. Multiple albums have songs by oh, that's a bad example. Um, let's let's go ahead and do concerts, okay? A concert can have many artists, okay? If I go to a concert. Many concerts can have many artists. Many artists can have many concerts. Mm -hmm. In this situation, a performer, I, this performer can go to, they can be in this movie, they can be in this movie, they can be in this movie. Mm -hmm. So that is a many-to-many -many relationship. Many movies have many performers. Whereas with a review, this review for Blazing Saddles is only good for Blazing Saddles. It's not good for... Um, any other movie? Any other movie? Okay, thank you. Cool. Great movie, by the way. If you haven't seen that, go watch Blazing Saddles. Very funny. Okay. 
So let's do this. I know I need to store an array of object IDs inside of my movie model for cast now. So we can go type that out. So let's go to our movie model. And underneath reviews, I'm going to add a new field called cast. We're going to add this back in. It's going to be an array. Okay. And the array here has a type of schema.types.objectID. Okay. We talked about this when we first started talking about MongoDB. This is one of the seven or eight data types we're allowed to use in here. This means that the type of data that will be stored in this array is an object ID. That is it. If I try to put something in this array that is not an object ID, it will throw a cast error. It will say, hey, that's not an object ID, you crazy person. Okay. The other piece of information that I have to give, technically this works as is. This will work as is. But I don't get to take advantage of the magic that comes along with it. And that magic is populate. Populate is something that you're going to see in a minute that lets us say, take all these object IDs and go turn them into their respective documents. For populate to work, I have to list what model this is referencing. I have to say I'm storing an array of object IDs, each of which references a performer document. Okay. How does it know what a performer document is? Because of this. Oh. Yeah, sort of. You were getting there. B plus answer. It's because of the schema. The way we export the schema, we give it a specific name as a string. That's how it knows. So here, when we say we reference the performer model, it knows what the performer model is because we've set that model up that way. We've given it a name. It's kind of cool. Okay, so we're storing an array of object IDs that reference the performer model. The property type of object IDs or object ID or an array of object IDs is always used to implement referencing. Ref performer is optional, but again, without that, we can't use populate which you're going to see in a minute. Okay. Let's contrast these a little bit more. One-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships. The key difference between a one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationship and a one-to-many relationship, each of the many child documents belongs to only one parent document. Each time we want to add a new relationship, the child document must be created. Think about that with movies and reviews. Every time I want to make a new relationship between a review and a movie, I have to make a new review. That's common sense. If I want to make a relationship between a review and a movie, I'm making the review at the time I'm making that association. In a many-to-many -many relationship, existing documents are referenced. And the same document can be referenced repeatedly. New documents are created only if it's the first of its kind. Okay? So think about that. If I want to put Harrison Ford in Star Wars as a cast member, what two things must exist first? Him and the movie. Harrison Ford and Star Wars. 
for me to associate them with the many-to-many -many relationship, they must both exist. Does that make sense? I can't reference something if it doesn't exist yet because I don't have an object ID to use. I can embed something as I'm creating it, but I can't do that. I mean, technically, I could do that with referencing, but it's it's essentially creating the thing that you're referencing and then adding the object ID. It's just it, you'd have to add, go through an extra step in your controller to actually create the resource before you make the association. The point is you must have both resources before you're able to make an association. It's just the way it works. Okay. Before a many-to-many -many relationship can be created between two documents, often called an association, those two documents must first exist. This requires that the app provide the functionality to create the two resources independent of one another. Have we done that? Can we create movies? Can we create performers? Yes. Yes, we've done that. So creating the association is just a matter of adding the object ID to an array on the other side of the relationship. I need to add the object ID of a performer to this array to associate that performer with this movie. It's that easy. Take a look at the data. We don't have any movies yet. We have a bunch of performers. We don't have any movies. Okay, let me go make a movie. Okay. Take a look at this. Cast. Okay, it's an empty array. So is reviews. I now have the ability to push object IDs into this array of cast members. Okay, so how do we make that relationship? This is where the, the last little bit of this comes into play. Okay. Um, the array property can be on either side or both. Again, we mentioned this earlier. Often the app's functionality reveals which side makes more sense. For example, viewing a movie with its performers is slightly easier to code by putting the cast array on the movie model versus a movies array on the performer model. Okay. If I wanted to see the details for a movie and see all the performers in a movie, if I had put movies on the performer model, I would then need to query for the movie to get the show movie, I'd have to do movie.findbyid. And let me just fucking code this. This makes way more sense to show you rather than just talk about it. If I wanted to do this, this the hard way, okay, I would need to say, if I had put the, uh, the, the relationship on the opposite way, let's say I put movies array on the performer model, okay, I would need to do something like this. I would need to find, uh, let's do... Uh, function, don't do this. Um, uh, actually, it's not bad that you do this. It's just function hard way of doing this. Rec res, right? I would need to do performer. Well, first, I'd need to do movie.find by ID. Rec.params.movie ID. Then... That gives me the movie. Oh my God. And then I would need to do performer dot find. And I'd need to find all the performers where the movies, and I'd need to have code in here that like had a movies array inside of this where movies includes a the object ID of the performer. Okay, and th this would be a whole nother thing. This would be a pain in the ass to actually code out. Also, that auto imported something. I saw it pop up and I don't want it. Okay, pain in the ass. What we're going to do 
is we're just going to query for the movie. And because of the way that we've set this up, we can populate our cast using a special method called populate. It turns all of those object IDs into the full document that they actually represent. Okay, let's answer a couple quick questions and we'll code this out. True or false? If a book document wants to refer and reference an author document, a property of type object ID must be included in the book schema. No. False. False, yeah. Why? We didn't do that for the performer schema, so assume the same applies with books. The author's the child, and the book is the parent, so we need to put the object ID on the author. Our movies document references performers, right? Right. So our movie schema has an object ID that references a performer. It's, it's true. Take a look at the model. If a book document wants to reference an author document, a proper, let's change this to movie. If a movie document wants to reference a performer document, a property type of object ID oh. must be included in the movie schema. That's how referencing works. We have to have an object ID to reference something. Okay. okay. So I can need to draw a map with all these links <laughs> to get all of this. Yeah. It's a good idea. A great idea is to have this, because that's what this is. An entity relationship diagram is your map. Okay. Second question, true or false? Assuming a many-to-many -many relationship between movies and performers. When associating a performer document with a movie document, both documents must already exist in the database. True. True. It's true. Yeah. Cool. All we have left is to write this code. Let's take a break, clear our heads. We'll come back and do this. Be back in eight minutes, five after. Could I ask you a quick question? Sure. Is it about diabetes or is it about... <laughs> no, it's, it's about coding. Go ahead. <laughs> um, just going back to the, one of the questions you asked right before we broke, those true and false, true or false questions. Yes. I'm trying to see if, um, if I think I got thrown off by a language thing. Would that, uh, for that specific question, if the relationship is many to many, would you need object IDs in both things, essentially? No, you just need, you're going to see, we're not going to do that. This is going to be a many to many relationship and we're only going to have the object ID on the one side. You could have it in both places, but we don't need it in this situation. So all we need here is the object ID of the thing that we are referencing. And again, this let's get the code written and this will make a lot more sense. Cool. Thanks. And that's mainly because, uh, actually, go ahead. I'll, it'll probably answer okay. my question. If it doesn't, let me know and we'll do it. Okay. So let's start by um, going to, I think we may have already done this, but on our movie controller for create. Let's make it so that when we create a movie, it takes us to the movie's ID page. Okay. So just making it a little easier here for us. Whenever we create a new movie, let's, instead of redirecting back to the list, Let's redirect back to the specific movie show view. Okay, that's an easy fix. That's just a redirect to a show controller. Okay. And then there's the last part of this. As a user, when viewing the details of a movie, I should be able to add a performer to the movie cast with a drop down menu. Okay, so let's think 
about what we need to do this. Okay. In the show view, we're going to need to iterate over the movie's cast and use EJS to render each performer. Okay. So in order for us to see the performers that are associated with a movie, we're going to need to see the performers that are associated with that movie. But because we're using object IDs in that array, we're going to need to take those object IDs and turn them into the actual data. Okay. All I'm storing in here, what am I doing? All I'm storing in here is an object ID, an array of them. That doesn't have the name of the performer in it. Okay. As written, it's just an, uh, an array of object IDs. That's it. So we're going to use populate to turn those object IDs into the documents that they are referencing. Okay. Then with a form and a dropdown, we can send a request to associate a performer with a movie. We're going to need a list of all the performers to build that dropdown. But we only want movies or performers that aren't already in the cast. Okay, so I, again, this is going to sound weird, but here's here's the details view for this. Okay, we're going to add a little thing that says cast here, and I want to drop down, or, or it's going to display the cast, and it's going to have the name of all the cast for our movie, right? And then there's going to be a little drop down that says add cast or add performer to cast. That add performer to cast box needs to have a list of all the performers that are currently not associated with the movie. So we're going to have to do some magic on the controller end here. In our controllers, we're going to need to find a list of performers not currently associated with the movie. This is going to be wild. Okay, We're going to accomplish quite a bit here. We're going to use a lot of little tricks to do this. So start by going back to our movie controls show uh, or a movie show controller. Okay. And this, I know this isn't going to make any sense because we haven't really talked about this yet. I'm going to come back and show you what this is doing when we do it. Okay. But we're going to add an extra line in here dot populate cast. What this is going to do is it's going to turn all of the object IDs inside of our cast array into documents, performer documents. Okay. This line will go through every object ID in our cast array. And for every single object ID, it's going to go look it up in the performers collection and send back the full performer document. So when this line runs, it turns our array of object IDs into an array of documents, just like reviews. Reviews are full documents. Okay. It's turning this array of cast IDs into an array of cast performer documents, essentially. Okay. This one line does all of that work for us. Wildly useful. Incredibly useful. Stupid powerful. So much benefit from this one little line of code. Okay. We can chain populate after any query. You can put populate after any query. Christina. Is that line of code inherited from Mongoose? So like the dot populate? That is a Mongoose method, yes. Okay. Okay. How does populate know to replace the object ID with performer documents specifically. We put it in the model. Yeah. In the model, we said, hey, this is going to hold performer documents. This specifically right here. This says, hey, these are going to be object IDs that all represent performer documents. Okay. Repeatable pattern. 
Populate is the method of choice to ensure that you have access to the data for a reference document. Anytime you want access to reference data rather than just the reference itself, you'll need to populate that field like we're doing with the cast here. Okay. I don't just want the little nugget object ID. I want the whole thing. Populate turns the little, it, it makes the little object ID seed bloom into the full object or the full document. Okay. Also, in our show controller, we're going to need to make another adjustment. Right now, I'm finding, well, I'm not finding any of the performers, but in our show controller here, I need a list of performers that are not currently associated with this movie. Okay, right now, there aren't any performers associated with this movie, so it's going to be all of them. But like, we need to think about how we write this. Because when we do this query, I'm going to have a list of cast members show up in the movie. There's going to be a thing here that says cast, and it's going to show all the performers. I don't want to be able to add a or add a performer twice. So if a performer is on this list, they should not be in the list of performers that I can potentially add. So I need to query for all of the performers not currently associated with this movie. This is the hardest part about all of Mongoose movies. It's it's not really that difficult. It's just a lot because there's some weird code in here you haven't seen before. Okay, But we're going to do this. If I'm going to query for performers, I need the performer model. So I'm going to go bring that in. Cool. Now I can look for performers using the performer model. Okay. Next. The, again, this looks bananas, I know, but it's not that bad. Right now, what am I doing when I find my movie? I'm rendering it. But before I render it, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put some space in here so we've got some room to work with. Once I've found my movie, I'm then going to find all performers where the underscore ID value of that performer is not in movie.cast. Syntax for this is just, it's, you'd have to look this up. Do I expect you to use this in your applications? No. Is it really freaking cool? Yeah. This line of code says, go through all of the performers in our database and find all of the performers that have an ID value that is not in this movie that we just found cast property. That's pretty cool. Okay. There's tons of cool tricks like this that you can do with Mongoose. Okay. This is a really, really easy way to query for a very, very, very specific piece of data or set of data. Okay. So this gives me a list of all performers that I haven't already associated with this movie, which in this case is all the performers. Okay. Is there a way I can look at that? It's going to return. It's a query, so it's going to be dot then performers, right? Is there a way I can look at that? We could console.log it. Yeah. Okay. What else do I need to do? I've gotten out of whack here, right? This query, because I've put it inside of, I've, I have a dot then inside of a dot then. Technically, this is my code needs to run here now. So I have to take this render method if I want it to happen after, and I have to put it here. You want your code to run on the innermost dot then. That way, everything is sequential. And this, by the way, is why some people choose to do the async await method. Because if you do async await, you don't have the constant tabbing in. 
it's all on one nice even line. You don't have like five levels of indentation here. This, if I hit refresh, I should see a list of performers. There they are. Hey, y'all entered a lot of performers. Here's a list of all of our performers. Cool. Hater tot. I love it. What do I need to do next? Pass those to the view. I have all these performers. Let's add them to our, our view to be able to render them. You know what else I should do? There's a dot then that ends right here. I should have a dot catch there. It's not in the lesson, but it's good practice because with every dot then, we need a dot catch. Okay? This function has gotten bananas, but this is the way you would write something like this. So you can see here, we're going to have some sort of cast property where we display cast associated with the movie. And we're going to have a drop down that has people not associated with the movie and a, a little add to cast button. Okay. So we're going to make a little bit more of a refactor here. We're going to go to show EJS. And if I remember correctly, we have a, no, we don't have it. Yep, there we go. We scroll up. This was one of the comments that we had listed in. What? Here. We have some EJS comments that have all of this in here for us already. Kind of like a, hey, put your shit here. Okay. So what we're going to do is where it says start cast list, we're going to put this code. All this is, is a div, a UL, and a bunch of LIs. Okay. For every cast member that's in our cast list, we're going to put their name in a, an unordered list. This isn't rocket science. This is something we've done before. We hit refresh, we should see cast. We don't have any cast associated with the movie, so we're good. Eventually, their names are going to pop up here. That's the easy part. Now here's the difficult part. We need a form. Again, let's copy and paste this. We'll talk about it. The form is going to go beneath this add, ca add to cast form below this comment. Okay, What does our form look like? We hit refresh. What it does, again, the action and method we're going to need to fix here, because we're going to need to talk about what this is. Our select has a name of performer ID. Select has a name of performer ID. We're going to have to think about that. For each of the performers not associated with the movie, we're going to make an option tag so that we see this. That's it. Horse number one. Yeah, I love it. OK. 
Okay, here's our list of performers not currently associated with the movie because we're just looping over them and we made a select tag. I guess this really isn't that complicated. The, the place where it gets complicated is this. What the fuck is this? Why is the performer ID listed here? Isn't this the information for adding? Wait, never mind. No, 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 no. Say it. You're right. So far. It's the information for adding the. Um, the performer the ID to the movie's cast. Yes. Object. Yes. Air high five. That's exactly it. Take a look at the value tag on our option. The value is the ID of the performer. Check this shit out. I go in here and I inspect the element. Notice how each of these values, it says Billy Idol, but the value tag isn't Billy Idol. It's Billy Idol's ID. So whatever we click here when we hit submit is going to be the name property or attribute of this HTML element, which in this case is a select tag. So name is performer ID. So how am I going to access this performer ID on the back end in our controller? Blank dot blank dot blank. Rec dot body dot uh, performer ID? Exactly. Air high five. That hurt. Good it job, good. Rich. Rec dot body form data. Form data. Name property is performer ID. So whatever the value is for this select tag, which is going to be one of our options, will be rec dot body dot performer ID. Exactly right. Oh, I feel the light bulbs going on. It's warming up. Cool. Now what? You've got to make the form work. Uh-oh. Which one? We have, what, three, six, nine, 11 of these. Which one do you think it is? Eight or nine, leaning towards nine. No, leaning towards eight. Eight is one of the two. Is it nine, then eight? Oh, no, that's not right. That's a read. Nine is reading something. We want to create something. We want to make a many-to-many -many association, right? These two. Seven and eight. This works. Because we would pass the movie ID and the performer ID both in a... What is happening? Because we would be uh, providing both the movie ID and the performer ID in a route. Okay? We wouldn't need a data payload if we did this. We can put both of those pieces of information as URL parameters. This is an option. We're not doing that this way. We're doing it this way. Why are we doing it this way? I guess it's not a why, because there's not really a difference as to why. But what indication have I given you that makes us think we're doing it this way instead? Where are we sending the performer ID? To the movie. Via? Uh, Rich, 
What was your last answer? I know oh, that was like eight the years model. ago. Of the, the schema. Nope. That oh. Body. Body. Payload. Form data. We're sending the ID of the subscriber, or in this case, the performer in rec.body. It's in the payload. Okay. We can send that either in the URL or we can send it in the payload in the body. Either way, doesn't matter. Sometimes you're going to want to send it in the URL. Sometimes you're going to want to send it via form. Doesn't matter. Okay. Is there a way to know which one you should use? No. You can do it either way. Okay. So if we know that rec.body.performer ID is the ID of the performer. That means we need to make a post request to slash movies slash movie ID slash performers to associate a performer or a movie with a performer. So this is the one we're going to go with. This one would be, would be successful or acceptable too. We just wouldn't need rec.body on this because both of the values we need would be in URL parameters. We haven't talked about using multiple parameters, but you can have as many parameters, route parameters as you want in your routes. You'll need to do this for deleting reviews or tickets or whatever your resource is. If you want to delete a ticket for a flight, you're going to need the movie ID or the flight ID and the ticket ID. Same thing for meals. To unassociate something, you're going to have to have both of those values. Okay, so let's do it. Let's make a post request to slash movies, slash movie ID, slash performers. That is this. Action, slash movies, slash EJS out, movie dot underscore ID, slash performers. What's the next step? Give me an R. Added route. Route, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't R. Route. Okay. Where do I add the route for this? Movies or performers? Which router do I use? Movies? Right. Why? Because you're updating the information in movies? Yeah. I'm updating a movie, essentially. I'm adding to a movie. I'm editing a movie. By adding something to it. So we're going to use the movies router. Post. I'm going to put it at the bottom of my posts. Boink. Slash movies, movie ID, slash performers. Uh, what do I call it? What does the chart say? Oh, no. Doesn't say. What's a name that makes sense? Add to cast. Yeah, I like that. Add to cast. Cool. Let's go write the controller.
that's the point of day where people's eyes start looking fried and they get starting to get red and bloodshot. And... It's all right. We're almost done. What do we need to do in this function? This is, again, this, when we have more complicated functions, we need to think about what needs to happen here. We need to find the movie. Add the performer ID to the cast array. Save the movie. Redirect to the movie show view. Okay, those are the things that need to happen here. We need to find the movie, add the performer to the movie, save the movie, and then send the user back to the show view so that we see the updated cast list because that'll trigger a redirect or that will be a redirect, which will trigger the show view again. Okay, these are the things that we need to do. Don't try to write your controllers without mapping out a roadmap like this and have a place to go. If you don't know what to do, Pop a message in the engineering channel. Hey, what are the things I need to do to make this happen? I'll give you the pointer, a pointer of what to do instead of giving you the answer. I'll say, these are the four or five things that you need to make happen in here. Go write the code for it. I'll give you the pseudo code for it if you just want a hint. Okay, let's do this. Find the movie. Find by ID, right? How do I find what rec.params.id? Movie ID. Then that gives us the movie. Add the performer ID to the cast array. Movie.cast.push rec.body.performer ID. Save the movie. Save as asynchronous, so we need another function here where we can then redirect to slash movies slash movie dot underscore ID. This is a complicated one. Probably the most complicated one in the lesson. But when you break it down into steps, it's really not that bad. Okay. One of the things that makes this easier, again, is this. Talk about what you need to do in human words. Human. Human words. And once you have it in human words, you can write the code. This is why pseudocode is so freaking important. Okay. This does what we need it to do. So I'm going to get, well, let's test it just to make sure. Okay, we need error handling too. So boink and boink. Okay. Let's test it. Nobody's done anything yet. Star Wars. Harrison Ford. Add to cast. Hey. Okay. Carrie Fisher. Mark Hamill. Notice that those people are not on this list anymore. Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's what the looks on your face is right now. It's okay. I promise it's going to be okay. This is confusing. You're going to get to practice with this with meals. It's going to be the same exact thing. You're going to do the is movie or is meal already included in flight. Like you're going to do the same exact thing to get a rep with this with flights. Okay. So don't, don't let this consume you.
let's do a couple of review questions and then we'll go I'll go crawl into our holes for the day. Okay. What's the property type used in schemas to reference other documents? Object ID. Object ID. Describe the difference between one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships. That's a tough question to verbalize, but let's just talk about it. Drew? One-to-many relationship is a... Um... Some uh, the one part of the one to many is something that only belongs to a single document and will not belong to other documents, and the many is, um, fuck, <laughs> the many to many is uh, an item that can belong to one document and another, and it's not exclusive. Love it. Is that right? That's great. Nice work. Air high five. What's the name of the method used to replace an object ID with the document it references? Populate? Populate. Okay. Let me show you how populate works. Okay. Here's our populate. Here's where we're populating our cast. Okay, I'm gonna break this real quick, but it's okay, because we'll still be able to see the console log. I'm gonna console log performers inside of here. Actually, let's do it. Let's console log movie. Okay. This is going to break. It's okay. But I'm going to hit refresh. Okay. Notice with populate, I have a cast, and each of the things in the cast ID is the object ID, but it's the whole document. It's the entire performer document. This is an array of performer documents. Without this populate line, if I run this again, it's just an array of object IDs, which is why I don't see any of the properties here. I don't see their names. Okay, I don't see them on. I they're not on the list either because of the way we coded that. But I don't see their names because those properties don't exist. Because all I have here are object IDs. Populate turns these object IDs into the full document that they represent. That is why populate is the shit. Think about how much work that would take us to do. We would have to look up every single performer document and find all of the ones that are included in that movie and then return all of them in an array. That would be a pain in the ass to write out. But all we have to do is say, they're popular, guys. we're done. If you feel like populate something you want to use in your app, but you're confused on how to do it, please say something to me and I'll walk you through it. I'll sit in a breakout room and just talk at you for like an hour until you finally get it. If, if you think that's what you'll need. I know that doesn't sound appealing to many of you, but like knowing how populate works will make you a better person. It will make you, well, it'll make you a better developer. It's, no, it won't make you a better person. Talking to me for an hour will make you a better person. Know how populate works, please. So wildly important and so useful. And it makes the rest of coding stuff so much easier because it eliminates the need for like unnecessary queries. And it's going to give you a better idea how uh, referencing truly works when we get to unit four and like join tables and shit. Okay. What's the level up down here? Now nah, level up stupid. It's just birthdays for the performers. That doesn't really do anything for us. Don't don't waste your time with that. Oh man, I need to update these docs. 
we're, we're in Mongoose 8 right now, aren't we? Oh, shit. This is why I need David in my life. Oh, yeah. Yowza. Yeah, these are two versions out of date. I'll fix that at some point. Jurgen, are you grading anything right now? No, I'm following along. Okay. No, do particular. you have stuff that is gradable? Um, do we have things to grade right now? Yeah. I'm pretty okay, sure. never mind. Never mind. I'll go update those at some point. Populate hasn't changed between six and eight, so it's not a big deal, but the, I need to make sure eight just, 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 just came out. So I need to go make sure that it, our docs are updated. Where do we go from here? Your lab. Go do your lab next. Are we going to talk about the Unit 2 project page, like requirements page? Or is yep, that I'm going to go over that. I'm going to go over that first before I make it public. Oh, okay. Jurgen, um, you don't have access to edit? That's strange. I know, it threw me off. There you go. That's funny. Um, cool. All right. Asa. Uh, just for, uh, could you push your code? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay. You have everything you need to finish your flights lab now. Okay. How far along are y'all on that? Who's done with part one? Good. You're in a good place then. Okay. I'm going to stick to Friday on that for right now. And here's what, here's how we're going to handle that. I want to stick to Friday. And what I want you to do is if you feel like you're not going to be able to make that Friday deadline, talk to me. And I'll do one-off approvals for people that need to go past that if necessary. But I want that done before the weekend. I don't want to have to give you an extra day on that. Which technically you still have two days, so it's not outside of the bounds of what we've done in the past. Okay, that's it. Let's talk about your projects. <clears throat> 